Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Good as always to have you on board. This episode is going to be a little bit of a lighter show, a fun show about deploying on Navy ships with dogs. That's right. Dog lovers, listen up. Uh, first, today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. I can't help myself from smiling right now. That's because I have Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental. I pay no deductible for in-network services. My in-network preventive care is fully covered, including three cleanings a year. Learn more at bcpsfepdental.com. Before I get to my guests, I'd like to highlight a couple things happening at the Naval Institute and in the pages of proceedings. This month, our longtime CEO and publisher, uh, Navy retired Vice Admiral Pete Daly, who's been our CEO for about 12 and a half years, is turning over with his relief, retired Rear Admiral Ray Spicer. Admiral Spicer was a surface warfare officer in the Navy, later held senior positions at Boeing and IBM. He will officially have the con on 1 December. Uh, and if, I would encourage you, if, you if, if you're not a frequent reader of the CEO notes, in proceedings um, to go back and, and uh, take a look at the last couple in the October issue and the November issue. Those are Admiral Daly's uh, sort of signing off uh, CEO notes. And uh, I will I will tell you, having worked for him for seven years, best boss I've ever had. And he has been really transformational for the Naval Institute, taking it from an organization that was struggling in 2011 to an organization uh, that is uh, thriving today. So. Uh, we will be sad to see him go, but uh, we think we have a new, uh, a great new CEO uh, coming in in Admiral Spicer. Uh, second thing I want to remember, I want to mention today is uh, coming up in the December issue of Proceedings, which we're working on feverishly right now. We're going to be kicking off the third phase of the American Sea Power Project. Uh, this phase is going to start with a, a conflict scenario, China-Taiwan conflict, set in 2026 followed by a series of essays in both the December issue and the January issue by warfare area experts. So these are experts that we've gone out and, and uh, commissioned them to write about undersea warfare, surface warfare, strike warfare, mine warfare, amphibious, et cetera. And additional articles we published in January, followed by a new essay contest, which we're kicking off called the Future of Naval Warfare Essay Contest. And what we want you, our readers and listeners, to do is to read the scenario in the December issue, read the articles uh, by the experts in December and January, and then respond to the scenario and respond to those articles written by the experts with your in, you know, further analysis. So you might read what Admiral Sandy Winnefeld has written about mine warfare, for example, and say, yes, and or no but, or you know, uh, offer some new thoughts on that topic or whatever topic, um, you know, warfare area that uh, you might be interested in weighing in on. So look for that American Sea Power Phase 3 kicking off in the December issue. Okay, now let's get to the fun part of this show. My guest this morning joining us from Virginia Beach and from Chesapeake, Virginia, retired Navy Captain John Cordell, a retired Commander Bob Alpagini. They are the authors of an article in the August issue of Proceedings that we're going back to titled Deploy with Dogs. John and Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's start with uh, with intros. Uh, John, you go first. Give us your background and, and tell us your dog story. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so a uh, retired Navy captain, went to the Naval Academy and was a surface nuclear officer for 30 years. Um, my had the uh, honor and pleasure to command two ships, the Oscar Austin, a DDG-79, named after a Medal of Honor recipient, and USS San Jacinto um, cruiser that was just decommissioned last month. And so I retired from the Navy in 2013 and came back in 2020 as a human factors engineer, working on sleep and fatigue in a position that was created after the collisions and the comprehensive review in, uh, in 2017. So that's kind of my story. And uh, you want me to go straight to the dog story? Uh, yeah, tell your dog story, and then we'll go to Bob. Okay. So Oscar Austin deployed in December of 2002. We kind of knew we were headed into a wartime scenario for Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
And we left and stayed underway for Christmas and pulled into Rota, Spain for New Year's. And during that visit, we had time to go enjoy some local restaurants. And uh, certainly there's, there's no shortage of dogs in Spain. And so one of them came up to the chiefs and started eating French fries from their plate. And they kind of adopted them over the four days that we were in port. So the last night, um, I'm sitting there eating dinner with the XO. And the chiefs came up with the dog in their arms and said, hey, Captain, can we keep him? And I looked up from my dinner and said, sure, and went back to eating and didn't think much about it. So the next day we get underway and uh, the, the navigator came up to my stateroom and he's kind of, you know, hedging his bets a little bit. But he says, hey, Captain, did you authorize a dog to get underway? And I kind of looked up and said, maybe. And he goes, well, we got one and I have hair all over my uniform to prove it. So sure enough, Oscar had gotten underway with us, and uh, we never pulled in again because the war started. We were launching tomahawks, doing escort duty through the uh, Strait of Gibraltar and Strait of Hormuz, went into the Gulf, and we never pulled into port. So he became part of the crew. He was up topside for revolutions, running around. Um, he stayed in the Harpoon Equipment Room. We got chow packages from lots of sailors, families, and he pretty much became a sort of standard item and, and really – didn't really get known uh, too much uh, because we didn't really publicize it until one of my friends photoshopped the picture of a St. Bernard on the uh, bow of the ship during an unwrap brief that uh, was publicized. And so we kind of caused some grief for it. Uh, but at the end of the day, he was part of the crew and we brought him home. We pulled back into Rhoda. My XO had a cousin who was a veterinarian and gave him his shots. They came back from the uh, visit with a bill for $300 and said, hey, you know, if, if this uh, dog had orders, we could get him this for free. And so I printed out some orders from an officer that was inbound, changed it to Oscar P. Dog, signed it off, sent it to Force Protection School, and next thing you know, we've got a dog with his papers. Um, I put him on my customs form for $25 and uh, one dog, and nobody asked any questions, and he went home to live with the gunner's mate chief who then retired in Virginia Beach, and he lived there for at least another 10 years. So that was Oscar P. Dog. All right, Oscar P. Dog on the Oscar Austin. That's uh, circa two thousand two and three. You said, right? Yes, sir. All right, awesome. Okay, so uh, Bob, let's uh, let's hear a little your your background and also your dog story. Thanks, Bill. Great story, John. Um, so I uh, retired in two thousand eighteen out of joint staff as a surface warfare officer, um, in class ninety six from the Naval Academy. I commanded USS Stout. I was the XO and CO on USS Stout between 2010 and 2014. Um, and I had, a, I had an extraordinary experience that the Navy can't do on purpose if they tried, which was to have an XO who was one of my best friends as Divo on my very first ship um, on USS Mahan. So when we commissioned Mahan in 1997, um, down in Tampa, uh, the former crew of USS Mahan World War II version, um, which was a destroyer that was sunk by kamikazes uh, in at Philippine Sea. Um, we're telling these incredible stories about their time as sailors. Um, there was a good number of them there, including the CEO. And they told the story of the ship being sunk. And as she went down, the CEO being the last off the ship, carrying the ship's mascot, the dog, in his arms. Um, and they talked lovingly about this dog and just left it an incredible impression upon both of us at the time as young division officers. So many years later, as the XO and CEO now of USS Stout, uh, based out of here in Norfolk, um, we had been through uh, some trials and tribulations that landed the ship, unfortunately, on the on the front page of Navy Times. And, and we spent uh, a lot of time rebuilding the ship, um, very much so trying to, to do exactly what every CEO and XO wants to do, which is make the best darn ship in the Navy. Um, and that was every single crew member um, obligated and dedicated to that. So um, our deployment in 2013-14 uh, was a uh, ballistic missile defense mission in, uh, in support of national mission for what was going on in the time with Syria, uh, which we were one of five destroyers deployed. And it was very open-ended up to 10 months, best guess of what it was going to be. So we spent the first uh, few months at sea, never touching land, which was which was great, great bonding experience, but you could see it begin to wear on the crew. On the previous deployment, the ship had lost about a third of the crew um, for various uh, various reasons, a lot of them psychologically related, um, you know, the challenges of, of, of a high stress environment. Um, so we wanted to be ahead of that type of thing. 
So when we finally did uh, pull in the port in Hanya Creek, um, the CO suggestion box had been had been uh, filled in a healthy kind of way over the previous months with a, a, a fair number of, hey, Captain, can we get a mascot? And that ranged from a parakeet to a dog to a, <laughs> I think, I think there's a couple of calls for ferrets and lizards too. Uh, but dog became kind of the obvious, uh, but had no idea what the reality of it was. So uh, XO doc and master chief and myself started doing some research to see what are the actual rules in certainly in six fleet across the Navy. Um, and what we discovered in, in getting into the regulations was that there was a fair amount of latitude, um, quietly, uh, a fair amount of latitude for the CEO to make a decision. And you really didn't necessarily need to, um, seek permission, although it was wise to, um, and otherwise, you had to comply with uh, health and safety regulations. So, uh, at dinner in Hanya, we uh, in Hanya Crete, we um, uh, put it out to the junior officers uh, who we were having dinner with. We said, "Hey, you know, we're we're thinking seriously about this dog thing. Why don't you guys do some discovery and and figure out what the options are?" Uh, my thought being that perhaps next time we pulled into port, we might move a little bit closer to that decision. Of course, when you ask JOs to do something, when they're go-getters, they go get it. So the next morning, they ambushed us on the way out of our next dinner uh, with the dog on a uh, on a on a piece of clothesline, and um, kind of like dealing with your kids. Can we keep it? Can we keep it? Um, and it was <laughs> absolutely beautiful Greek hairhound, um, which are uh, a, a a particular breed that's that's prevalent in Crete and Southern Greek, but you really don't see it anywhere else. But a very beautiful medium-sized dog. Um, well, that became Captain. She followed us onto the bus. Pet Captain, can we bring her back to the pier, Captain? Uh, so the deal I struck was, hey, Doc, I need you to really get into the regs and what do we need to do? Um, XO, how do we make sure we're not going to get fired? And um, to my JOs, you can have my driver and the car, and you guys have 24 hours to get all the all the shots and everything else uh, and get the dog dewormed. Um, and it just so happened that the driver had a, uh, a cousin who was a vet on the other side of the island and got everything done in record time um, and uh, found out that I, I think I can actually do this. And so we got underway uh, the day after next um, with the dog on board and quarantined her uh, for four days in an airlock on a DDG. And she was the best taken care of dog in an airlock you can possibly imagine. Um we created a SOP of where the dog could and couldn't go. And, and uh, the, the crew had created a care package of squeaky toys and all the stuff to make a nest for the dog. So the dog lived up on the bridge, uh, on the, the back bridge wing, uh, inter internal bridge wing area of a DDG is a perfect spot for a dog. Um, so they made a little nest for her back there and we named her Hanya after the town that we found her in. Um, and she uh, typically slept at the foot of the helmsman, um, rolled up in a ball. And uh, if I happen to, to be coming up on the bridge, then she would immediately pick up on that's that's my guy. That's my that's my master. So she'd shift her position to come over and hang out by my feet, by my chair. Um, and that's where she spent most of her time. We had some great trainers on the crew. Um, most of her care and feeding was led by our DCA. Um, she organized most of it to make sure that there were no gaps in the care and feeding of the dog. Um, but. Anybody who uh, wanted to could sign out the dog and take the dog for a walk out to the flight deck and and um, play with the dog. Um, there were areas that we made sure, you know, no engineering spaces or anywhere that was too too steep ladder well wise. Um, but the dog very much became part of the crew and, um, you know, I made sure in reaching out to Six Fleet Medical, to my Commodores, both home and deployed, um, that that this uh, quiet project was underway for for morale and health and welfare. Um, and they were very supportive, but all agreed we should keep this on the on the low key end of things. Let's keep it under the radar. Um, but very much a, uh, a full crew participation aspect. And when um, when we pulled into port, it was a big thing to make sure folks um, played with the dog and, and she was well taken care of. And advancing the clock all the way to the end of the deployment, um, all but one person who started that deployment finished that deployment ended up being just about nine months um very arduous deployment a lot of operational activity um and i attribute a significant portion of that to the doc the dog and my chaps 
you know, a tremendous team that played to the psyche, to the heart and to the soul of each crew member who it's very difficult to be an unhappy sailor when you have those three resources available to you, a great mission and the opportunity to take a dog for a walk on a ship in the middle of the ocean, um, which became one of these legendary stories that until Dr. Cordell and I had the opportunity to write it down and, and get it in proceedings, um, risked fading into, into uh, mythos. Um, <laughs> glad we were able to get it out there for all these sailors who were swearing to their buddies, we had a dog on stout. Trust me, I'm trust so glad me. you guys did write it up because uh, you know what, what a great story. And, and you're right. I think most people were probably not aware that one, this is um, in accordance with regulations in the Navy that you can actually do this, uh, and and that you know um, there were there were ways to make it work, and 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 not only to make it work, but that it had tremendous impact on both your crews in a you know, positive morale impact. So, uh, but fast forward to today. And the Navy is uh, kind of going back to this, right? So there are some programs that the Navy is doing uh, to experiment with dogs, putting dogs on on, on ships. So, John, uh, talk a bit about what the Navy is doing today, notably on the, the USS Wasp uh, and uh, LHD and also the aircraft carrier uh, Gerald, Gerald R. Ford on deployment now, by the way. Exactly. Okay, so, you know, it all comes down to people, right? And so the CEO of WASP, uh, Nakia Cooper, and I had served together. And uh, there was some discussion on his ship. His XO was quite interested in the idea and reached out, and we talked about it. And then they started to pursue a different course um, than, than Bob and I did of permission versus forgiveness. And so they actually reached out uh, to the Much With the Mission, which is a group that provides service dogs to, to individuals, but also provides therapy dogs that can deal with a large group of people and provide some some comfort. And so they uh, went through the, the wickets of, you know, there's some legal stuff you have to look at of, you know, who pays for the dog food and, you know, something as simple as that, medical care, things like that. They decided that the, the Big Deck Amphibs and the carriers were a good fit and they worked with much with the mission. Uh, now, to be clear, you know, unlike our plan, this requires a good deal of effort on the part of the ship. Somebody has to go through a 120-hour training class to, to learn how to deal with the dog and become sort of its caretaker. And uh, I think on one of the ships, it was the chaplain. One, it was the Deployment Resiliency Counselor. And so they went through this training. They bond with the dog. But then the dog is present at various evolutions. I was aboard WASP about two weeks ago, and, and, and Sage was – I'm sorry, Ike was on the quarterdeck uh, to greet you know whoever was walking aboard the ship at that time. So – uh, the feedback has been very positive. They got permission. Uh, Admiral Plain here at Surfland was, was supportive. And uh, they have had Ike aboard for a while and plan to deploy and then collect some information on what impact he's having on the crew. And then so uh, Sage on uh, out on Ford, those XOs and captains got to talking and decided that they wanted to do that. And they came up with a plan, presented it to leadership, and it was approved. And so Sage deployed with them back in May, I believe, and has been out there the whole time. And you can see some pictures on Facebook and other places of him with his with his paw pads on and glasses. And uh, and so definitely acclimating. They've actually put him in a helicopter to take him to the smaller ship. So you have the Holy Hilo. I guess now you have the Hound Dog Hilo. And, uh, and so it seems to be working very positively. Uh, the last piece is uh, Colonel Todd French is in charge of sort of the Navy D or the DOD. Uh, animal programs and uh, they're looking to collect some data so they call this a pilot with the idea that it could expand and uh, you know hopefully in a couple of years you'll see a dog on uh, on every ship if the captain is is that something the captain wants got it uh bob back to you for a second so uh you, you gave us the story of uh, your experience uh, on stout um, I'm curious, are either of you aware of any other, you know, small ships? So, John, you just mentioned that um, the, the Wasp and the Ike are kind of going through not begging for forgiveness, but asking for permission. And so they've kind of pre, you know, gone through all the wickets with uh, with their current dogs. But are either of you aware, or, you know, Bob, are you aware of any other ships that did what you two did, where it was like, yeah, we'll just adopt the dog and then we'll ask for, for you know, we'll beg for forgiveness uh, afterwards. You know, have, have there been other other stories, as, especially after the article has been published, that you heard from other ships uh, adopting dogs like you guys did on deployment? I heard uh, inklings and rumors, but nobody who's outright admitting it until there's there's uh, more probably more permission given. I think somewhere uh, somewhere after after my episode, there was uh, they closed up some of the latitude on it um and there was a i think a guy with a goat 
we might have gone a little bit, a little bit uh, overboard, if you will. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> stay, yeah. Try, try to stay within the lines. I don't, I don't know, but I would suspect there's pro. We we didn't uh, we didn't invent this one ourselves. No. Uh, Bill, I know of one other, um, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name now. He actually wrote a book, uh, as I did, to, to sort of document this uh, story. So, Neil, um, I'll find it and send it to you. Send you the okay. link. Okay. All right. All right. So there are some other Kuzumoto. rumors yeah. out Yeah, there. Neil Kuzumoto. Yeah, Kuzumoto. Yeah, that's it. Neil yeah. Kuzumoto. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so John, back to you. So, you know, uh, well, this is a fun conversation. Uh, you know, the, uh, the subject of dogs on ships is very heartening. Uh, but if you scratch the surface a bit, it also points to some morale and retention issues in the Navy. And, you know, we, we know that the, the Navy and other services had a hard time hitting their or missed their uh, recruiting targets this year. Uh, retention has been a, a challenge. You know, there's been a lot of stories. Uh, our USNI news team and other news teams have covered, you know, suicides in the Navy. Um, so the Navy is now working with this Mutts with a Mission group that you mentioned. Um, what are and you also in in the September issue you wrote an article called the Navy must double down da double down on suicide awareness and prevention programs. So that was in the September issue of proceedings. You know what are some of those other programs aside from having um, mutts with a mission on ships uh, that the Navy is you know experimenting with or doing some trials with and perhaps need to you know push some more emphasis behind some of those programs to have the impact that they need. Sure. Hey, thanks, Bill. And first of all, thanks for publishing that article. It was a uh, uh, an interesting journey to kind of put that together and, and and gather those ideas. And I really appreciate the fact that you could put that forward. So um, back to the dog thing, just one other note. There is another uh, entity, Commander Tracy Krauss over at the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth or at uh, Sewell's Point has service dogs as well. that She can take them out and visit ships and and shore commands uh not underway but on a daily basis if you ever visit her in her office you're gonna have to sit between two big old uh golden retrievers so, and what, so what, what job does she have what what is her position that she gets to have dogs and and do this i i, I want that job maybe after, uh, after yeah maybe. she is medical corps and uh i'm gonna forget the exact um i think she's a public health officer Okay. But this is a passion of hers. And so it kind of goes to your question of, of these programs where here you have this program that is tolerated um, but not necessarily advocated for, uh, even by the Navy or her command. They let her bring the dogs in. They let her do her business. But it's not like it's out there in the public domain, hey, come and use this resource. And so that kind of got to the theory uh, or the, the premise of my article that before we go reinventing ways to deal with this, let's look at what we have in place. And so if you don't mind, I'll hit a couple of them. This yeah, is my please. opinion. My opinion doesn't always comport with what the Navy is doing or, 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 or thinking, but uh, that's why proceedings exist, right, to share these ideas. And so the first one was the Deployment Resiliency Counselor. So I talked about that as one of the dog handlers that volunteered on one of the ships to do that. These are licensed therapists that are out there. They have to have, I think, a master's degree and several years of experience. And they actually deploy with the ships. I had no idea when I was active duty. I don't know if Bob had heard of them before. They are currently assigned to aircraft carriers and large tech amphibs. And there's supposed to be two of them. The challenge is they're tough to recruit. They're tough to retain in this environment because they actually go to sea with the ships. But then... The challenge is if, the, if you don't fully man the ship with two of them, you lose that mutual support. They can't trade off, and so they can burn out. And so, Are they, are I, they active duty? Are they military? Or are they no, they're civilian? not. They're all retired. It's kind of like a, a highly qualified PACE instructor. I hate to use that analogy, Got but it. they're civilians yeah, yeah. that they sign up. I think they're in the NAF category, the, the, not, not GSs, but, but government employees. Okay. And uh, they, they you know, usually have sort of outfitted coveralls with DRC on them, and they, they live on the ship, and they, they interact with the crew. And so they have formal counseling sessions and informal sessions where they can sort of try to get to the left of problems, identify sailors that have issues, and provide counseling, training, but also, you know, get them to the right help that they need. And so if we were to expand that program, the challenge is they're just on the big ships. So sometimes the need is on the smaller ships where you have an independent duty corpsman. And so if we had a, a sort of a program where these deployment resiliency counselors were in our fleet concentration areas, places like Rota, Spain. Bahrain, Mayport, Yakuska, then you'd have another resource that's out there on the deck plates talking to the sailors and, and getting that pulse. They also have a program where they have some assistants now that are not quite as heavily qualified 
but also can assist them in administrative duties and things like that. So that's a program that we have in place. Uh, we probably need to double it uh, by adding maybe another 12 billets, but I mean, that's within the realm of the possible. The next one is behavioral health technicians. So there's articles about this out there. The RAND uh, Corporation did a study. That is a skill set that's added at a C-school, I believe, to, uh, to the corpsman. And then they can go out. They're not mental health professionals per se, but they're sort of triage agents to sort of identify folks and help them. You know, just as a corpsman would help you if you broke your leg or cut your arm, they can at least uh, get you that first level of care and get you to someone who can help. So we kind of centralize them, even th- despite the fact that the instructions allow for decentralized deployed applications. The ships that have taken them, the smaller ships, destroyers, cruisers, that have taken those folks on deployment have had brave reviews for their impact. But we have not really capitalized on that by perhaps putting all corpsmen through that school when they get to be E5 or E6. Uh, maybe add that to the independent duty corpsman pipeline. So those are a couple of resources that are out there that we could expand upon where we're using sailors and, 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 and trained personnel out there on the deck plates. The last one that I've been exposed to recently is called Safe Talk and Assist. So this is more of a training program, an awareness program, that's offered right now through the credo process, so the Navy chaplains administer it. But it has an operational view, and, and it's a three-hour course. It sort of teaches you how to interact. I think back to my my friend that I mentioned that, uh, that took his own life back when I was a uh, uh, captain. And he and I had a conversation. He was a Commodore. I was in command of San Jacinto. And I just noticed that something was off with him. And uh, But I didn't really act on it. You know, we, we're all under stress. And so... Uh, uh, two days later, he had, uh, had taken his life. And I always thought about that. And uh, when I went through this course, it really, it was almost shocking to see how I missed the signs of, of what he was talking about. And this course sort of gave you that, it even has a role-playing event where you ask someone else, are you thinking about suicide? And so I've watched captains squirm in their seats trying to have that conversation. And so it's a very powerful thing that we have in, in our inventory. We paid for the seats. Um, and it's a three-hour class, and so we could put it into pipeline training, into a session training. SecNav just sat through a session. We posted on Facebook. Um, so it's known, but I don't think it's leveraged like it could be. Um, there's other things out there like uh, cognitive behavior therapy that could be leveraged. Um, gun locks. Um, the article has about 15 things that are currently programs in place that I think we could level down uh, or double down on without inventing new stuff. And uh, so that was kind of the point of that article. And yeah, uh, yeah, I think a lot, I'll, I'll, a lot of programs already in place that with just a little bit more push behind them, a little maybe some more resources and more awareness, even exactly. You, yeah, you exactly. Can, you could in, increase the impact of them. Yeah, good points. Uh, so, Bob, talk about leadership, the impact of leadership for a minute. When you were in command, how did you perceive your ability to impact your crew's morale? And then how about the ability of the folks higher up in your chain of command to impact your morale as a skipper or as a, as an XO? Leadership is fundamental. Um, I've been taught that and I learned that to the core going way back the Naval Academy days. And even before, um, when it gets to the ship aspect of things, the ship, uh, any command, any business on the private side will, will reflect the leadership of the ultimate leader in the organization, whether that's the president, the captain, um, but empowering people all the way down the line to the most junior person say that you two are a leader and you are empowered within, you know, your realm to make change. Uh, my leadership, my command philosophy on stout was fix now. It's very simple. Um, find fix, a problem, now. fix now. <laughs> find a problem, fix a problem. If you can't fix it, Make sure you find the person who can. Make sure it's communicated up, uh, and we're going to fix it together. And that's operations, that's people, and that's material. Um, and you could you can spend days writing uh, long command philosophies, but that served my purpose well at the time for what the ship needed, for what the command needed. Very simple, very philosophical, and you're on the stage where you have to live that. So I went by that. I expected my sailors to go by that. Um, the dog was a part of that. You know, I saw possibility for for challenges and wrinkles in the in the psyche of the ship as we went into combat operations and other things that required their full attention and their full readiness for that. So what resource can I provide and what risk am I willing to take in order to provide that? That was not a hard one. Um, At the same time, I had great leaders um, over me. Both of my Commodores were spectacular and went on to do great things and still do as flag officers now. So it didn't seem to harm them too much. Um, but 
I, my philosophy reflected their philosophy, which was do you know, innovate, um, bring the innovation forward. That was, again, we didn't, we didn't invent the idea of the dog thing. You know, there were World War II sailors who showed me the way on that one. Um, however, you know, there is science behind it. There is human emotion behind it that says this actually works. So being willing to bring that forward and knowing that when push comes to shove, I had leadership over me who would make sure that I wasn't going to burn for something that was meant for my sailors. Um, and that's, that's fundamentally leadership. And I think anybody who was on the ship at the time walked away with some lessons along those lines of what are you willing to do to make sure your folks are taken care of? Because can I, can I ask just scratch the, scratch the surface a little bit. You mentioned earlier that when you took over stout, uh, that she had come off a previous deployment and, and about a third of the, of the crew had gone home early, had had left the ship during deployment for one problem or another. Um, what was what was the root cause there? What was going on uh, with the ship before you took over, and and what were some of those things that you know would require you know sailors that many sailors to leave before you know the deployment you know uh, completed? Um, <clears throat> I think you know, unfortunately a lot of it's documented, but. What uh, what took place at the time was a long continuum of uh, very high op tempo, um, already challenged turnover processes where there weren't enough people to man the DDGs. And I think that's probably still a, a little bit of a shell game of how we put crews together for deployment. Um, but Stout was, was one of the uh, recipients of that at the time. And so in the with the good intention of putting together the crew that had all the billets and all the the, the uh, checks in the box where we've got the people we need to have as opposed to do we have all the right people that we need to have and mm -hmm. do I have the latitude, you know, my, my predecessors to if, if somebody's not working well, am I willing to accept them for their technical skills regardless of the fact that they may be a toxic uh, element? And I think that built up over time. Um, and there were several incidences prior to deployment that weren't, weren't handled well. And so this stuff built up um, over time. So that by the time you got onto deployment, it exploded. Um, and it impacted the, the CEO and master chief at the time, um, impacted half the chief's mess uh, in a segment of the wardroom. And it was really the my first class petty officers um, who took the reins um, and took control to then carry the leadership forward in this new gapped leadership area where khaki was a large segment that got changed out um, and how to how to start making the ship right and so those first class did a spectacular job of that empowering them to do that and recognizing what they were doing as this bevy of new chiefs came on board and new officers and new leadership um, that is an important piece of it and that's again that empowering folks to do what they already need to know already know how to do um, and leading them well. And that was the beginning of the change over a long period of time. Um, but a lot of suicidal ideation, a lot of um, physical ailments that were clearly caused by psychological conditions, um, just tremendous stress throughout that deployment that led to high, high turnover rate that only compounded operational problems. Oh, I, love, I love the point that you bring out there that uh, your first class petty officers really stepped up showing that leadership is uh, is possible at, at all ranks, right? It's, yeah. it's not necessarily at the 05 and command master chief level. It can be done wherever it's needed to be done. That's a great example. Um, so, uh, John, uh, I mean, Bob's point there about, you know, what led to some of that degraded morale on stout, a lot of uh, overworked, long deployments, you know, we're hearing a lot of that uh, across the force right now. And, um, you know, that's been going on for a long time in the, in the post, uh, nine 11, you know, phases of the Navy 20 something years now where ships are doing these nine month deployments, 10 month deployments, uh, quick turnarounds and maintenance backlogs, all those stuff. Uh, I was talking to a young division officer, uh, just last month on a, on a DVG, and, and she, you know, was pretty blunt with me. She said, you know, struggling with the hours and the schedule and the workload and the, you know, the one and three uh, in port duty section and, um, and said all of her fellow division officers also feeling very overwhelmed. So 
You're a humans factor, human factors engineer at Surfland now, Surface Forces Atlantic. You know, what are you hearing? And you know, are, is there an end in sight to this, you know, uh, the, the overworked and underpaid kind of uh, sense in, in the Navy? Wow. Hey, great question. And uh, I can certainly relate with that junior officer. I think uh, when you look at the landscape right now, there's really three things at work. The first is uh, just the number of ships and the demand signal for the ships. Uh, the Norfolk waterfront right now is pretty empty because of the actions going on over in the Middle East right now. And who knows when they're going to come back. The ships are already out there. SAGE may end up with a couple of sea service ribbons because of the extended deployment, right? Um, so the number of ships is a piece of it. The number of people is a piece of it. Manpower is calculated based on a formula for how much work there is, how much watch there is, and how much sleep you get. And when that formula gets out of balance, as the GAO calls it, a resource to requirements mismatch, you have um, – Work for for 300 people and you're manned to 250 or 260. If you're supposed to work an 80-hour week, that translates into a 100-hour week. And, and where does that extra 20 hours come from? It doesn't come from you're not going to not eat. You're probably going to work out some. So what gives is sleep. And so that's why our surface forces average about five and a half hours of sleep underway. Uh, now, they are in a circadian watch rotation, most of them, which the science will tell you is, is better for fatigue. And that has been a uh, sort of a sea change for the services over the years. Uh, but I still think, I, I tell folks we're about six years into a 10-year culture change when every commanding officer acts like Bob and says, okay, we have to start with the people. And there may be things you can't do, and there may be things that you have to defer or delay in order to get there. Uh, the Bonham Richard obviously was a wake-up call, again, for the import side of things that forced a lot of ships from six section to three section. Most of our ships now are in four, so maybe five, but still, that's another thirty percent. That's another thirty nights a month, a year that you're home, that you're not home, right? If you go from yeah. six section to four section, so it's a fifty percent increase in nights away from your family, which is a stressor. And uh, we all know that that in addition to workload stress, the family stress and relationship stress is is a, is a factor in suicide, suicidal ideations, etc. So you know, you ask, is there a way ahead? I I'll be honest, I don't think that Manning is going to get a lot better anytime soon with recruiting challenges, with uh, some of the unfunded billets that are out there. And so it becomes incumbent upon the, uh, the leadership at all levels to sort of recognize those things. I think we have come a little bit further in, in the ability to say it's time to take a knee or it's time to, to, to deal with this and, and, and get our heads straight before we move on. I think fatigue is part of that equation. Um, if you look at the recent suicide report, fatigue was one of the tier one items. To, uh, to promulgate a, a formal policy, which uh, most of the type commanders already have. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a math problem, and that's the challenge. And how do we get past that is by properly, back to Bob's point, putting the right people in the trained positions, making sure that they're ready to do the job, but also making sure, you know, in the human factors world, you look at the person that's in the middle of the system, and most of our systems are built with the assumption that when, when Ensign Bill Hamlet shows up to watch, he's 100%, right? He's well-rested, he's properly trained, he's mentally there. Um, and that's just not reality. And so we have to take that into account. And uh, I think we're starting to get there. I see a lot more conversations about it and a lot more incorporation of those human factors into the training, into the planning. Um, but the workload is still there. And, uh, and so we have some work to do in that area. Yeah, good points. So we're about out of time, uh, unfortunately. So let's get back to uh, a, a little bit, it, it, closing out with dogs and on a happier note. Uh, so Sage is, as you mentioned, deployed right now on the USS uh, Gerald R. Ford, uh, which we know from our fleet tracker and USI9 news team off the coast of uh, Israel, Lebanon right now. Uh, you mentioned, John, she might be uh, uh, up for a couple of uh, sea service medals. Uh, and, and maybe a, a beer day or two underway there <laughs> off, of, uh, off the Levant. Um, but your, your article, uh, there's, there's a point or a couple points in there about the actual uh, physiological impact of um, somebody who's tired and stressed being able to, you know, scratch the ears of a dog. Um, what, you know, how does that work? Like, uh, what, what kind, and how, with a, with a, with a, uh, with a ship of, of either 300 or maybe 5,000 on an aircraft carrier, you know, how, how, what's a watch bill for a dog? I'm just curious about that. <laughs> you know, I guess they stay busy. 
back back to the demand, you know, the math equation, right? The demand for the dog, I'm sure, is very high. So, how, how do you how do you balance that as a as a commanding officer or as the you know the dog handler on board a ship? Right. Uh, I don't know, Bob. You want to take a stab at that? A little bit easier for us on the small boys, um, but they, uh, you know, we had the log and they'd come up and you had the the coalition of the willing, which was, you know, the ship wanted it. They asked for this. Um, yeah. I just happened to be a dog lover, so that, that helps too. Um, so, you know, they, you would have the individuals who'd come up and take the dog on a regular basis, but then you'd have them have her out on the uh, on the flight deck where people didn't know that they like dogs suddenly discovered that they like dogs and throw on a ball and, and and all that stuff. So it gets very organic um, and it doesn't become very much of a schedule challenge on a smaller ship. Um, and that's, I think, one of the fundamental pieces of this is, is if you force it upon a command, it's probably not going to work well. But if the right. demand signal calls for we would really like to have this, um, then that is the catalyst for it being the right the right prescription for that command. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, uh, John, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I would say uh, maybe you should replicate this podcast with the CEO of WASP and uh, and Ford when they come back from deployment. Ooh, that, see what that they say. That is a great idea. That um, is because they'll idea. have the life experience. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, what, um, to, to your point, Bill. I'm um, sorry for the for the uh, the impact of dogs. I think uh, you know if you uh, if you just think about the way you feel when you come home and your dog is waiting at the door. Um, and doesn't care who you are. There's a good article that I that I saw in the uh, Davids talking about the impact of dogs, and there's actually two parts to it. The first is, uh, and I'm not a scientist about this. I don't. I, I'm just going to no, tell you my view of it. And uh, but it just makes you feel better, right? There's some there's some some something in your body that that that, uh, that, that brings better mood when you interact with it, with a living being and you pet the dog and it's a calming effect. The other thing is the dog can sense uh, levels of stress and anxiety and take action. So some of the some of the training, as I understand it, includes if the dog senses a certain level of stress, they'll actually like lay their head in your lap and apply pressure. Um, it's kind of like, uh, I guess for the dog, you have those thunder shirts that they wear that sort of provide some pressure to calm them down. Yeah. And so it has a calming effect. So the dog can actually sense it. And, and you know, there, there's dogs out there that are trained to detect like diabetes blood sugar levels and the amazing things that dogs can detect that we don't even understand. Um, but at the end of the day, you can over science the thing. I mean, it feels good to have a dog around and, you know, it, just back to those other, those other measures we talked about, not every sailor is going to respond to the same. I have a good friend who just doesn't like dogs, right? Sure. And so they're not going to respond to the dog. Some have dog allergies. So everything can't be for everybody. But my point is um, let's, let's not make it either or let's add them all up. And and hopefully one or two sailors respond, and then you it's paid for itself, right? Yeah, great points, great points. All right, well we're out of time. My guests today have been John Cordell and Bob Alpagini, both retired Navy surface warfare officers who commanded destroyers with canine crew members on board. Their article is <laughs> titled "Deploy with Dogs." Check it out in the August issue of Proceedings, or if you want to find it online, just Google. Proceedings deploy with dogs. And it'll pop right up on your screen. It's a fun read, and uh, and it, and it's also got you know really uh, significant impacts for current Navy morale underway. So happy to see that the Navy is uh, is taking some of those lessons and, and and playing it forward. So gentlemen, thanks again for being on the show, and uh, I wish you the best of your, the rest of your week. Thank you. All right. Well, this episode is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. I can't help myself from smiling right now. That's because I have Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental. I pay no deductible for in-network services. My in-network preventive care is fully covered, including three cleanings a year. Learn more at bcpsfepdental.com. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.